why these things don't you know gain momentum why the research doesn't you know have this sort of like ding okay is because policymakers are controlled by money and so that you know they they don't read these reports one and two they're not going to change because they won't get elected the next you know election cycle if they if they you know change how our agriculture systems work so i think you know that's that's the issue here right we have too much control in the hands of too few Danielle Nuremberg is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media, Innovators Magazine, and sponsored by the Alohas Regenerative Foundation. Danielle is a world-renowned researcher, speaker, and advocate on all issues relating to our food system and agriculture. Danielle is president of Food Tank. Foodtank.com is the website and an expert on sustainable agriculture and food issues. She has written extensively on gender and population, the spread of factory farming in the developing world, and innovations in sustainable agriculture. Danielle is the recipient of the 2020 Julia Child Award. Danielle found, founded Food Tank, a 501c3 nonprofit organization with Bernard Pollock in 2013 to build a global communi community for safe, healthy, and nourished eaters. The organization has more than 250 major institutional partners, including the Rockefeller Foundation, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, the Christensen Fund, IF. PRI, IFAD, Oxfam America, Slow Food USA, UN, FAO, and the Crop Trust, the Sustainable Food Trust, and academic institutions in all 50 states. Food Tank highlights hope, success, and innovative ideas in our food systems through original daily publications, research articles, a chart topping podcast interviews and events and summits in major cities around the world. Prior to starting Food Tank, Danielle spent two years traveling to more than 35 countries across Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and Latin America, meeting with hundreds of farmers and farmers groups, scientists and researchers, policymakers and government leaders, students and academics, journalists, documenting her work and their work to help alleviate hunger and poverty while protecting the environment. She has built a worldwide social media web following, more than millions, uh, 1.2 million, probably even more now. Uh, and it just is climbing and climbing each and every day. Tons of wonderful content. I know your head hasn't exploded yet, Danielle, but it's so wonderful to have you on the podcast and have you here live in front of me. Welcome. Thanks so much, Mark. Nice to see you. It's great to see you and you deserve every one of those accolades and, and uh, I could go on much longer. And that's really why I wanted to talk to you. Um, it's it's uh, in, in the past, it really hasn't um, been about you or pounding your chest on you. It's, you've <laughs> opened up a space and a voice, a platform, a, an area to bring out the important voices on the ground of farmers, of indigenous peoples, and uh, a real diverse spread in the food industry, um, allowing them a safe place uh, to talk about food, what is needing, lacking policies. And uh, I suspect that's one big reason why you received the Julia Child Award in 2020, but I also believe it's just an amazing thing. And so I want to thank you for that. But in that in that process, you've talked to thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people over, over the years and have heard all sorts of stories. But now I want to hear your stories. That's why I've got you here. I want to hear your story of what you've learned in this long process. Um, for my listeners, you and I know each other from originally uh, 
kind of online in the past and then from the EAT uh, form, the EAT Foundation event in Stockholm, Sweden, then the uh, Borrelia Center for Food and Nutrition in Italy. We, we've seen each other there and then we're together on the uh, Aleph uh, Farms Sustainable Advisory Board. So our paths have crossed and we've kind of collaborated and, and you wrote a wonderful contribution for Menu B, which hopefully will come out very soon. So um, basically, I'm, I'm, I, I, I want to ask right off the bat, have you learned something in these uh, <laughs> uh, these uh, uh, times, uh, not only of crisis, but in the in the years since you've been doing this work from all those people that you've talked to, that is something that's emerging that you can share with us that, hey, this is what I'm hearing. This is really where we're going and what's what's emerging and what, what I'm what I'm getting from people. Sure. I mean, I think the thing that I've learned the most is that we need to listen more um, and people like me maybe need to stop, you know, talk less and listen more. I think that's one of the biggest lessons I've learned over this, you know, sort of experience of being involved in this work for, for a long time is that there are so many people who don't, there are so many well-intentioned folks in, in, in the food and agriculture world who think that they have all the answers and that they can go into communities and tell communities what they need rather than asking those communities what they need or listening to what those communities need. And again, you know, th these projects like aid programs and development projects are, are so well intentioned, but I think often you're, you're missing the mark because communities all over the world have very particular, you know, needs and circumstances and it's different in every country and every village and, you know, every municipality. And so I think the, the, uh, what I've learned is just sort of to ask less questions and listen to people. <laughs> and I, you know, it may sound sort of um, trite, but I, it, it's really the biggest lesson I've learned that you, you have to sort of um, immerse yourself in, in, in the challenges that people have and, and sort of understand them and let them tell you what, what they're experiencing rather than sort of, t you know, giving them your, your take on it. I, I agree, and I, I appreciate you you telling us that. In many respects, I, I want to ask if if that is um, because because I agree as well. I think we find these shotgun solutions or these programs that that we say, okay, and well, this will work all around the world, or this will work here, and it's developed by people in the U.S. for for people in in India, Africa, or in China, or wherever it is. And it's kind of a developed or a Western world approach, but they're not usually uh, indigenous, local, regional solutions that have even taken culture and, and the diversity of the food systems in certain areas into, into consideration. Uh, how, how do you feel about that? Do you, do you really feel, even though we talk about this global food systems and this, you know, global big problem that we've got to fix all over the world that it's really on based based upon local um local listening local, local cultures local implementations yeah. of things we can do yeah i mean i i do think it has to be grassroots it has to be there's so many top-down approaches you know this better than me that just haven't worked and you know if you look at the just like the u.s for example there's this really great um elder uh, activist, uh, Karen Washington, who I've learned a lot from, and she started um, Rise and Root Farm in the Bronx. And, you know, over the years, I've been able to interview her and talk to her. And, you know, when we're talking especially, and I think this applies, you know, sort of globally too, when we're, we're talking about communities of color, or we're talking about, you know, underserved or, you know, historically marginalized communities, what they need is capital they need investment and then they need you know the the people who invest to get the heck out of the way and i think that you know communities know what they want know what they need know where the the gaps are but they have knowledge and i think we we have assumed that they they need to be educated and they need all of these things especially from a a, a white perspective right and um you know in a western perspective and what they actually need is just investment and then for the rest of us to you know like i said before get out of the way let them do what they need to do and i also think that there's there's this lack of of investment in allowing folks 
to experiment and, and, you know, and make mistakes and try again. And I think this is something that I think about a lot around philanthropy. And I know philanthropy is in this state of sort of flux right now and how it needs to change. And I think there needs to be more investment in, in, in financing of, hey, you can make mistakes, you can experiment and, and try things over and over again, because we're stuck in this sort of cycle of two or five year grants you know, all of us, not the nonprofit world too, where, you know, if you don't meet these deliverables, then you're not going to get another grant or, you know, you're not going to get renewed or, you're, you know, part of your money will be taken away because you messed up. And I think it's okay to mess up, right? Uh, and so, you know, I, I think there's a lot that needs to sort of change in how we think about where, where the solutions are and who should be um, implementing them and, and, and you know, um, and how the, that process works. There just there needs to be a flip because as you know, and we've talked about this together, the urgency of what we're facing in the world, you know, our public health crisis, not just COVID, um, our climate crisis, our biodiversity loss crisis, all of these crises which are linked, right? But they're all, you know, um, uh, they need to be solved and they need to be solved, you know, not, by 2050 but by 2023 2025 we don't have you know that that much time to to waste here so it, it, the urgency of of you know these issues i think requires a flip a, a paradigm flip of how we we've been doing things and i think you know uh the the grassroots uh um solutions are out there the, we don't need to reinvent things we don't need a lot of of uh, we don't need more studies. We don't need more books. You know, we we just need to do what people um, already know works, and, and 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 make sure that those solutions get implemented. I I love that, and I'm glad you you brought that up because that leads me right where uh, kind of in the direction of where I want to go. You you know you've done the TED talks. You've you've hosted your own events. You've given your own talks. You you have your own books. I mean you. You helped Paul Hawken in his his latest book that came out, Regeneration, uh, in 2021. You've got Nourish Planet. Luckily, I got a nice si signed <laughs> copy here. It's a fabulous uh, from the Barilla Center for Food and Nutrition um, book. You've been involved in uh, with Teeb and and many others. The the letters to young farmers. You were a contributor in that book as well. Um, and then, as you just mentioned, these we don't need more books, we don't need more reports, more studies. Let's research the problem. Uh, food, food has been around. Uh, now we're getting ranges of twenty thousand years of agriculture of uh, yeah. probably not the way we we see it today as an as an industrial ag or even in regenerative practices, but. We have been moving rocks, cutting down trees, and doing some form of, of farming for well over 13,000 years, uh, even, even longer now so that what we're seeing from carbon dating and some other research popping up. Um, and through the years, you know, we met at the, uh, the initial live meeting was at the Eat Form the Eat Foundation, and there was the Eat Lancet report. Um, then, you know, Barilla, uh, uh, the Center for Food and Nutrition did some reports. You've been involved in, in different things. And in the past, I was always, oh yeah, this report, and it's going to bring the science. It's really going to help move the needle. It's really going to, and um, and even in the UN food system, which you, you kind of participated in, um, all of those things seem to lose momentum, fall flat a little bit, so to say. The report was, maybe it was because it was a report, graphs, charts, science, and and things that people like were bored to death and just passed out in, in the process. But it seems almost like they fell flat. And so I, I want to, I would like to get your take on if you agree of why you think that is. And and because I, I re really, for most of those, I, I had this great hope, like, oh, my gosh, you know, when this comes out, we're going to see some great movement. Finally, uh, and, and we're you and I are seeing this as well. Food has now firmly become a topic in the United Nations. For many years, it was hardly even there right. and, and discussed. And so, you know, that's kind of also why I have this hope. 
And so I'd like to get your thoughts and ideas of, of how you, why you think that is. And maybe uh, if you also had those hopes, okay, here it comes. Yeah. No, I've always had those hopes. You know, you, you, you get, ex I think, I mean, you and I are, are food and agriculture nerds, right? Like we get excited about data and science and innovation. And so when those reports come out, I, I do get excited and I do hope that they will, will move the needle a little bit, but that has not been the case as we know. And so I, again, there needs to be some, we, we need data, right? We need research, we need science. There's a lot already out there. There's a lot of gaps though, especially around nutrition, especially, you know, and, 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 and um, you know, what, what's, ha what's actually happening in those underserved and marginalized communities that I talked about before. There's a lack of, of data on health uh, around, you know, people of color, et cetera. So it's not that we don't need research, uh, but I think that what we need is, is more political will. We, we need more democratic institutions that can, you know, implement changes. And what we have, you know, is a lot of um, corporate um, uh, interference and control of our food systems and, uh, you know, whether it's through lobbyists or, you know, through um, other means. And, and I think we've lost why these things don't, you know, gain momentum, why the research doesn't, you know, have this sort of like ding, okay, is because policymakers are controlled by money. And so that, you know, they, they don't read these reports, one, and two, they're not going to change because they won't get elected the next, you know, election cycle if they, if they, you know, change how our agriculture systems work. So I think, you know, that's, that's the issue here, right? We have too much control in the hands of too few. And, um, you know, we're not, we don't have this political will to, to make the change that these reports suggest. So, you know, like I can be flippant about, hey, we don't need more reports or books. We do in the sense that we need more people to, to understand and, and uh, read them. We need more storytelling for sure. Um, and I think when sometimes when these these reports fall flat is because that they didn't tell the story well or they assume things. Listen, I love the Eat Forum, right? And I love, you know, so I much that they do. And I'm friends with, you know, a lot of people there. But that first Eat Lancet report, you know, turned a lot of people off because it didn't, it didn't, um, it, it identified one diet, right? That they, they thought would save the planet. And there are so many different cultures and so many different ways of looking at food that we need, you know, it needs to be a little bit more diverse. And so with the Eat Lancet 2.0, you know, 2.0 report that's coming out, I guess, in two years or next year, I'm really excited about that. But again, because I'm an agriculture nerd, right? I am or a food too, nerd, yeah. I, I'm excited to see what it says, but I think it will be more inclusive and, and more, um, uh, more diverse and talk about different cultures in different ways. So I, I, these are things that we're learning. I mean, you know, that, that, that's a really good example of how they responded to like, hey, there was some criticism, here's what we're gonna do now. And that's the kind of thing that's gonna push the needle, right? Like responding to, to the changes that need to be made. But again, we're entrenched in a political system all over the world where agriculture and food, whether the United Nations or, you know, um, or others are finally taking food on. I mean, it's 2022. They should have been doing these things before. It, we still have political systems that are corrupt and don't, don't focus on, on the needs of farmers and, and eaters. And that's where I see the real problem. I totally agree. And I'm glad you brought that up because you recently just kind of, I don't know if it was a host or moderated or you participated in. Um, and we had a pretty exciting thing happen in the US. Uh, I, I hope. Uh, I don't know if it was exactly what you want, but can you tell us a little bit what's happened in governance and policy around food? There was some kind of a, a government meeting on food, farm bill, something. Um, uh, what happened? Tell us about that. So Food Tank is involved in what's called the Healthy Living Coalition, which is private sector nonprofits, health experts, and others who have sort of come together to, you know, uh, focus on, on different issues for, for better health. Um, one of the things that we focused on was the Food Donation Improvement Act, which makes it easier to um, uh, donate 
food that would otherwise go to waste, both from individuals and farmers and, um, you know, businesses, restaurants, hospitality, and make it easier for that food to get where it needs to go instead of ending up, ending up in landfills. I, you know, you know this statistic or this phrase better than anyone. If, if food waste were it's a, a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions. So we have a real issue here. And so if we can have legislation that actually solves for some of this problem, then it, it can, you know, you know, again, move the needle, make sure that we're not wasting as much food in the United States. Um, and w what happens is that, you know, farmers don't have incentives often to, to donate food, you know, that would otherwise go to waste. That just never makes it off the farm, right? Because they don't have a market for it or it's not the right size, you know, because of, of sort of, um, I, you know, I don't even know how to describe it, standards from, you know, grocery stores or restaurants like, you know, I want a carrot that's three inches long, a tiny carrot, you know, not one that's six inches long, that, that kind of thing, those, those perfection standards that, that kind of, you know, lead to food waste. But if farmers had incentives, if they were actually paid or if there were tax credits or those kinds of things, they would give that food away. Otherwise, it's easier for them to compost it or just dig it back into the ground. And so that, you know, it makes it easier for the Food Donation Improvement Act will make it easier for farmers. It will definitely make it easier for businesses who fear liability. You know, um, they fear being sued if, if you, because if they, they don't donate something that makes someone sick, this removes that kind of... Um, that, that liability. And by the way, we, we have um, laws here in the United States that just didn't go far enough. And so, it's, you know, the, these companies, you know, just, they continue to fear it. It was uh, the Good Samaritan Act, um, uh, you know, that was passed in the 90s. It just didn't go far enough. So this is an improvement on that, that bill that came out in, in 1996. And so, you know, there, these kinds of things have a lot of bipartisan support. We had Republicans and Democrats you know, on stage talking about how great this this legislation is and why it's important and why it needs to be passed. And so hopefully um, we'll see it passed in Congress this year or ho hopefully it will be wrapped up into other legislation and passed that way. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Another thing, and this is, you know, the, um, not to deal with food waste, but the, this past weekend, I, uh, Food Tank helped plan um, for Nyman Ranch, which is a sustainable pork company here in the United States, very small, about 700 family farmers are part of it. But um, we hosted their far hog farmer appreciation weekend. And it was so interesting to me because the whole, and it, you know, the, the Nyman Ranch is based in Iowa. And we had the whole delegation, the whole congressional delegation, Republicans like Chuck Grassley and, and Democrats on the other side, who you know are supporting family farmers? They gave video testimonies of how important it is to support family farmers. So I think there is this growing sense that we're when everything else in the United States and really elsewhere in the world is very partisan or very you know you know black or white. That there you know when we talk about food, when we talk about farmers especially, that it can be nonpartisan. That it it it, it transcends that kind of political. Um, nastiness that we're seeing, you know, in, in everywhere else. And so those are the kinds of things that, like, give me hope. Um, I don't know how, you know, I don't know how much, sorry, my cat is howling. That's no, fine. Hopefully he'll stop. Um, uh, I don't know how much, you know, change that, that kind of thing makes, but it does give me the hope that things are, are moving forward, especially on the food and agriculture front. If you can get Republicans and Democrats to talk about these things, you know, and have the same opinion, that's, you know, the kind of, of, of push we need to move forward. We had, we had a push years ago in the United States, the Dole McGovern um, um, a bill and act that came out, which which was pretty uh, bipartisan and came together was was good. But there's uh, you know McGovern now. There's another McGovern now uh, that is that is moving forward on things. I know you have some connections and maybe have spoken to him before, or done something. But uh, are there any are there any new movements in in government, Congress that are, are moving in the right direction that gives you hope right now as far as farm bills, food in, in the United States, anything that you've heard of or or new conferences that are coming about that you um that you're saying, boy, you know, this is this is hopeful. And and if there's not, I mean what I'm really trying to tickle out is what things since you're 
your ears to the ground, so to say. You speak to all these people, such diverse groups, so many people, um, farmers, food producers. Um, what do we have to be hopeful for? What, sure. what What's coming down the road? And, and is, it, is it something to worry about that we need to make sure our voice is heard? Or is it going to be hopeful that maybe this will help us? I mean, I, I have to be hopeful, Mark. It's my job. Like, it's my mission statement, right? <laughs> to tell stories of hope and success. So I'm always hopeful. Um, as I get older, I get a little bit more cynical. But I, I do think it is... What gives me hope is young people, um, and always have. Even when I was a young person, I've always felt older than I think I will, you know, even when I was young. But it's young people who give me hope. It's students, it's young farmers. And I'll, I'll give you an example. The National Young Farmers Coalition here in the United States, you know, um, thousands of, of young farmers who, who, you know, are either part of it or interact with the, the, the coalition, they do um, a survey every couple of years and you know here in the united states we have the ag census and it doesn't always reach a diverse group of farmers and what i learned from this last national farm young farmer survey is that they've really made incredible inroads in reaching diverse farmers black indigenous people of color uh, who are young and, and in farming and the ag census just doesn't do that so getting that those diverse viewpoints, putting them into a survey, understanding um, the challenges and obstacles that young farmers especially face, you know, things like access to land. These are things that farmers all over the world face, you know, young farmers, access to land, lack of access to financial uh, resources and capital, lack of, you know, business education around the business of farming. Um, in the United States, you know, uh, a lot of young farmers are saddled uh, and burdened, really heavily burdened by student loan debt and the high price of um, health care, et cetera. You know, they're, despite all of these challenges, they're really excited about farming. They're excited about getting into farming. As we know, farmers are aging all over the world. The average age in the United States is about 60. It's the same in other parts of the world, like, you know, in, in regions of the world, like Sub-Saharan Africa. So we need this interest from young farmers, but if they don't have the resources, if they have to take, you know, two or three off farm jobs so that they can just pay the bills, then we're not going to see this, you know, this, this, um, the, the sustainable sort of practices that we need and, or, you know, or the kinds of diversity we need in farming, not just diversity of crops, which we certainly need, um, but also the diversity of people that are, are important to farming, you know, young women, um, trans folks, you know, uh, people who identify as queer, we need more, you know, people of color who are, you know, feel that farming is a, a viable career option for them. And, and so the, you know, it, it's that organization and, and organizations like it all over the world. There's YPARD, um, which is Young Professionals and Agricultural Development, you know, which uh, is, again, all, you know, works with, with agricultural professionals, researchers and farmers in, in different parts of the world. Those are the, the folks who give me, me hope because they are trying to, you know, um, make sure that young farmers' voices are heard, that young agricultural professionals' voices are heard, whether it's at big conferences or small ones or, you know, on Capitol Hill or, in, you know, in different kinds of parliaments. The, getting that, that, those young voices heard and listened to, I think, is really important. So that gives me hope, especially here in the United States. You... Um are are so right when you say we're we're both kind of nerds to this respect but you you took it even a little bit further your uh husband he's an agricultural economist isn't he yeah it's a lot of nerdy conversations in our yeah lives. so i'm sure there's you know this it's surrounded around this topic of of, of food constantly and um uh, you know, both, both that's his work and it's your work basically. So I'm sure it's ever present in, in what you do. And, and then I, and then I believe uh, the little I know about you as well. So you're also a pr pretty, pretty big foodie with um, food tank. And, and I mean, 2013 doesn't seem like a long time, but in, in that uh, in that short amount of time, you have really placed a movement on on the map of our world around food and knowledge around food, and and I thank you for that. 
I hate to give this referral or, or this reference, and, and that is I, I think that most big movements in our world have always been centered around basic resources and to be more specific around food. I mean, uh, the Gandhi's big movement was around salt and the food movement and <clears throat> about farmers' voices, about how we produce food, how the lack of food is and um, we we both know um, Ron Finley and others in, in that whole movement. You mentioned um, uh, some fabulous people already in our discussion, but basically what it's coming out to is producing your own food is like printing your own money. It's like yeah. growing your own money. It's a sense of security. It's a sense of connection to nature and the environment. If you're if you, um, even though it's seen as a job or, or maybe a career choice to some people, uh, if you even do it half-heartedly, you can see the impact on human health, on nutrition, and you see the impact on our environment in that process. And most, I, be, I believe in, in the good of humanity that that would say, hey, what are the better practices that we can use? What are the better ways to do that? Um, and so I, I'm kind of asking in that process, there's a lot of organizations popping up now to help transition the current farmers and those of the future to organic regenerative practices, other type of practices to prepare for that wave to, because they're realizing that's the stability for the future to really, to, 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 to get that harnessed and in what, what are you seeing in that uh, other movements and organizations who are doing that? And how do you feel about that, that direction that we're taking from industrial ag and industrial type of chemical, heavy chemical processing and foods? I mean, I, I think you're right that there are all these, you know, great organizations across the world. I mean, many of them, I, I don't know about, but that there is this growing social movement around, you know, food in, in a way that I, you know, haven't seen or, or read about in quite this way. I think there is, you know, because of what happened, you know, during 2007 and 2008, and then again in 2011 with the food and financial crisis, I think there was this growing sort of, there, there are kind of like two sides, right? There was like the AGRAs, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, which was really pushing for big farms and, you know, um, uh, more more use of inputs, and then there was this other side, you know, this 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 move towards sustainable, what you called regenerative practices, um, and and you know, there's not a lot in the middle, right? And I I do think there is an opportunity for those 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 farmers and farms in the middle who may not have transitioned totally to organic or but are still not on the real industrial side, you know. I, I think there's an opportunity in the middle too for for um understanding that you know you can do things more sustainably but you know still use artificial fertilizer if you do it responsibly or still use you know some kinds of chemicals again responsibly i think what we've we've lost in in the world is this you know the what, what happened, you know, with the, the Green Revolution after World War II is that there was the development of these chemicals that were supposed to be like medicine, right? They were supposed to be like, you know, they're supposed to help farmers get over a hump, right? So if, you're, if your soil was degraded, you're going to use this fertilizer for a short amount of time, or you're going to use this herbicide until you figure out how to handle this, this problem, you know? And, and now what, what farmers have been encouraged to do is, is you know, use them like all the time no matter what like you just apply them because you know it's part of the process and so i think we need um to understand that you know it doesn't have to be either industrial farming or organic farming that you can do something in the middle where those are those things are used you know um again like medicine that you know when you're when your soil's sick you do this and then your soil gets better because you've you you know you've used compost and and or manure and organic matter to 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 um supplement it as well so i i don't you know i'm not really answering your question i do think there are these these 
you know, these movements on, on other sides. But what we're forgetting about is that that farming sector in the middle that is not either or, that it is trying to do things the right way, but not not fully industrial and not fully organic. And and that's OK. Like we we need to support those farms and, and farmers as well. Do you, do you see that 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 we need to transition away from those or that we need to find a balance or we need to maintain that balance in the long term or how how do you see us uh, moving on the right side of history or attaining this that we've been talking about a lot in uh, whether it's the UN Food Systems Summit or any other reports or discussions kind of this uh, reformation of, of food or the change of uh, of our food systems out of the industrial kind of ag sector, yeah. even though that's the biggest part. I mean, the rest is very small compared to that. I mean, I think, and I, again, I try to be this hopeful person, right? Optimistic. I think the, the industrial model will be forced to change, not because it wants to, but because of the climate crisis and, you know, fuel prices will become unsustainable that, that, that those practices will no longer be, you know, available because they're simply too expensive. They're simply too, too resource intensive. And, you know, you, you mentioned um, the work around true cost accounting with the, the tea bag or food earlier. I mean, we're, we're still trying to figure out the true cost of, of our food. And if that were part of like, you know, what economists, especially agricultural economists, and my husband and I debate this a lot, you know, we're using to sort of, um, you know, define, you know, what these practices actually cost, then, then, you know, we would, we would go towards the more regenerative <laughs> practices. We would go towards the more organic practices because the, the, the price is, is better. The price for human health is better. The price for the environment is better. You know, the, the food is better. The, you might be paying more for it, you know, in some places, but um, you're not going to pay for, you know, pollution and, and, and healthcare and all of those other things. So I, you know, I think, industrial models will change because they are forced to not because people wanted them to change no matter how 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 much you and i actually want them to change they will it will just it will just happen because of the situation we put ourselves in with the multiple crises that i described before we are in such a, a terrible situation on planet earth right now planet earth will survive but humans might not because of what we've done right and so we have this opportunity that that we can take but i i think you know for for industrial farming to actually go away it will it will be because it's forced to i'm, I'm glad you mentioned that so now i i, I two things i um in our last in our last meetings, last time we saw each other was in Israel at a, a left arms. I, I get the sense that there's you you truly believe on the regenerative uh, front and, and and some of the practices, but it's become a buzzword. Regeneration. I mean, even though you help contribute to to um, the uh, Paul Hawkins book, regeneration kind of helped him get the right the people lined up and things. Um, how how is your feeling of that and and how has this actually a very old pra practice very old indigenous practice has been around before leonardo da vinci um as kind of i hate to say the word being bastardized in some respects today yes. but how, how do you feel about that and is is that just a natural thing that we have to go through to to come out on the right side and it'll work itself out or or what are your what are your thoughts or feelings maybe we can understand it better yeah i mean i go back and forth on this use of the term re, you know regenerative or you know and by the way paul hawken one of the greatest honors of my life to be an advisor on that book i don't know why i don't even know why how he knows my name so um always been very everybody nice knows your name no, but like such a like I mean, and he's really helped, you know, put agriculture at the at the forefront of, of as, as a solution to the climate crisis. I mean, people weren't talking before, you know, Project Drawdown and, and Drawdown came out. You know, a lot of folks, I mean, you and I understood, right? But like a lot of folks didn't look at agriculture as a solution to the climate crisis. And I think, you know, that his work has really helped push that forward. But, the, you know, you and I talked about regenerative and how it irritates me because I do think it um, takes away and minimizes the practices that have been done by, you know, for 
you know, generation after generation by indigenous folks all over the world and, and, and native folks all over the world. And so, you know, I, I know there are lots of people who, who think, well, you know, it's okay. And I've, you know, they'll say, well, I've talked to indigenous people who don't mind, <laughs> you know, that we're using that word. Well, you know, I, I've also talked to indigenous folks who do mind that white people like me use that word. And, you know, I think there needs to be um, a better understanding and a better honor, uh, better honoring and respecting of those practices and, and knowing where they came from and knowing that in so many ways, we as white folks are co-opting them. We are, you know, and, and we did this with organic though too, right? Yeah. Um, these are practices that were, you know, were, it, it, it's always like white people just discovered these things, you know what I mean? And they've been around for millennia. So I, I think that's what bothers me. I don't know how it will play itself out. I think, you know, as you said, um, regenerative, like organic, like sustainable has already been co-opted, you know, by big companies and others. And everyone is, you know, either trying to, to, to say that they're doing regenerative practices. It's happening like with, you know, climate friendly or, you know, climate neutral products too. And it's a lot of this is, again, well-intentioned. I think in addition to greenwashing, you know, of, of how we talk about things, there's also green wishing. There are, there are really mission driven companies who want to do things and they want it to do it the right way, but they're, they're, they haven't quite got there yet. And so they're, they're green wishing, uh, you know, for, for their products to be something that they're not yet. And, and, and so we just need to be aware of that. And I, I think that there's, you know, this is where it comes to people like you and me and so many activists and advocates we just need more education and awareness around these issues. People know so little about food. You know, I think the people who probably listen to your podcast, you know, know a lot about the things that you've, you've helped make them aware of. But so many people just don't know about where food comes from because they've just never had the opportunity to learn about it, right? And, you know, they've, they've lived in cities or they've just never had that, or they've grown up around corn and soybeans like I did, you know, and I didn't really understand what the farmers around me were doing because as far as I was concerned, they weren't growing food, they were just growing livestock feed. So um, I just think, you know, we need more, more awareness building. We need more education around these terms so people truly understand them. And, you know, and that, that the private sector really has to be involved in that. They have to be more transparent about what they're actually doing. Um, and, you know, hopefully, I, I am hopeful about that because, you know, Mark, and maybe we've talked about this before too, if you'd asked me 10 or, no, maybe not 10 years, but 15 years ago, if I would be talking to companies and corporations or be involved in, on sustainability boards for, for different companies, I would have said, oh my God, no. And I'm sure my 15 year old self is kicking, you know, looking at me right now and saying, oh my God, you've sold out. But I do think that we need the private sector at the table in this because they are so big. Even, you know, the smaller companies is just the private sector as a whole is so big. They need to be talking about these things. Food businesses need to be, you know, um, held accountable. And I think it's people like you and me who can help hold them accountable because we, we understand they're really powerful, but we understand that we can also, you know, sway how they do things. And, and that's, that's where a lot of this, this, this power lies, right? How we can sway companies to do different things, how we can encourage them to use different terms and, and, and that kind of thing. I totally agree. And I, I believe that we're at this true point in, in, in history where we're at the meeting of the S curves, where we're at a point of disruption of food. And although there are some really major big players out there um, who've, who've taken our, our food system down the wrong path, the majority of food producers are smallholders and, and uh, small, medium uh, uh, sized farms and food producers. And if we can unify them in, in a movement or to get on the same page on better practices or models uh, of, of producing food uh, without the, the help of large chemical companies or, or food companies in, in a commodity type of a way, I really think that that, that power lies within them to yeah. to make some huge changes and disruptions in, in our food systems and some of those we're already seeing we're kind of seeing the crust of, uh, cusp of that already with uh, alternate proteins you know the, the future of meats and different things that um 
are doing it in a much different way. And we need more organizations that are really concerned about the sustainability and the health factors up front before they have developed a product uh, uh, in the end. Um, one one other person that is in some other reports, I mean, there's all, all, obviously the Rodale Institute, which is a fabulous uh, uh, about organics and about regenerative ag practices and some different things up there. But more and more studies are coming out showing that regenerative, no-till, um, different types of farming food practices are actually just as productive, if not more, better for the environment, better for health, food and nutrition, and returns, soils, water runoff, water retention, you know, uh, growing topsoil over the years, um, then industrial ag or traditional conventional farming practices. And there's a, um, Peter Bick is a filmmaker of the Carbon Nation. He's doing a series of films that actually goes through you know, these side-by-side -side comparisons. I always have to laugh because why are we still, you know, looking for the chat, the graphs, the charts, the reports and the studies? I mean, we've been doing this so long, but it's like we almost need this proof, you know, is it is it uh, better to work with nature? Is it better not to put chemicals and all these, you know, all these other practices than the conventional ways? And so there's some really things that I'm also hopeful of that are coming out that are also better stories. They're shown in videos and movies and films that make a little bit more sense. It's kind of like the kiss the ground, you know, which was a, a, a big move in, in, in soils and things. And so I'm hopeful with those type of movements around um around these terms of regen and, 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 and food process uh, uh, production. Now, having said that, we are, um, or at least I was pretty hopeful um, when, the, when the Eat Lancet report was coming out, when the UN Food System um, Summit was coming out, like, I'm like, okay, now we've got this foot seat at the table, we're gonna talk about food. And then what happened is we were hit with the pandemic. And um, you have more stories about this than, than ever, uh, I'm sure, um, that during this time, food really uh, was a dual-edged sword in, in many respects. It was the biggest area that suffered in gastronomy and, and food delivery and, and um, um, production and food waste and, and, and many others. But it was also the biggest sector to grow because it's an essential service. I mean, there was more investments in, in, in food companies than ever before, more companies emerging to solve the problem than ever before. How um, do, do you feel that's a transition that we had to go through, whether it was the pandemic or economic downturn or now this Ukraine war, that to realize that food as a commodity, food not as a basic right, is just a setup, no matter where you're at in the world, for disaster. Yeah. And, and what, what are your thoughts and feelings? Are we learning those lessons to pull, pull that system into the right direction? Listen, I had hoped that the pandemic silver lining would be that people would understand food and agriculture much better, that they would understand the people behind their food, not, ju not just farmers, but food service workers, um, and, and not chefs, but food service workers, truck drivers, you know, grocery store workers, et cetera. And, you know, I saw that sort of at the very beginning, you know, there was a lot of momentum around, you know, especially around restaurant workers and because restaurants were closing and, you know, there weren't protections for restaurant workers, especially those who were either recent, you know, immigrants or undocumented here in the United States. They really suffered a lot, and I was hoping that you know this is finally like we're we're gonna we we are we are going to understand the people behind food, and I think we've lost that now. I, I think people have very short memories about the early days of the pandemic and empty grocery store shelves, which we're seeing again, you know, there's, there's still a lot of supply chain disruptions happening. Um, 
I, I thought we would be more empathetic to, you know, folks like delivery drivers and, you know, um, and, and just, again, understanding our food system a little bit better. And, you know, I wrote about that. We had Food Tank had a piece in Agriculture and Human Values, a journal about that and things that I was sort of seeing, you know, and hearing from Food Tank, you know, kept going during the pandemic. We did live stream interviews like twice a day with experts from all over the world. Everyone from like Maximo Torero, who is the, the chief economist at the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, to like farmers market managers in places like Minneapolis here in the United States, you know, just getting, you know, and everyone in between farmers in Kenya and, you know, just getting a sort of a take on what was happening around the globe. And I had just, you know, as, as scary as that time was, I, I still keep writing 2020 on checks because I can't believe like, you know, that, that, that time has moved on. As scary as that all was, I did have this incredible hope that we would understand food everyone would get it and like you know and we would finally sort of okay everyone's going to rally around you know farmers and food system workers and things are going to change and they're not you know companies like you know big companies made bank during the pandemic because people were hoarding and people were eating comfort foods you know like you know tyson's and you know <laughs> made, made a lot of money and then like you know when the executive order to keep meat processing plants open came down from the trump administration while people were dying working in processing plants you know um uh, processing plants were giving bonuses to people who you know if they came in so people were coming into work sick and then dying and it, it was you know the, the, that tragedy is is still unfathomable to me and so um i i don't you know I, i've heard the same from starbucks workers who were you know still for still forced to go to work even if they didn't feel good or they'd lose their jobs. And so, you know, you see what I am hopeful about and what has come out of the pandemic, maybe this is the thing that I'm, I, if, if I can find hope in is that, you know, fast food workers are organizing, um, grocery stores are organizing into unions. The Starbucks workers in places like Memphis and Buffalo, New York are not putting up with this, and excuse me, but like this bullshit anymore. They've been treated so poorly. So there is a, a greater organizing effort. So hopefully that will help, you know, us as eaters understand the, the price, the actual price that food workers pay when they go, you know, to, to, to serve us. Um, and then you mentioned, you know, the Russian aggression against Ukraine with the Ukraine war, the uh, Russian war against Ukraine. And I, I also thought that would sort of make people realize, I don't think it's going to happen until next year when bread prices soar, when there's a, when people can't find canola oil, when, you know, like, I think that's going to happen, you know, July, June and July of next year, when people really see the impact of what this war has done. And I, I'm not encouraging people to go out and stock up on canola or, you know, whatever, yeah. or sunflowers, you know, please don't hoard. But like, we're going to see those impacts later on. And so I think people just don't care right now. <laughs> They'll care when it's, you know, oil prices, cooking oil prices are so high or, you know, their bread prices are so high. But right now it's it's just not affecting them. It's something that's happening, you know, so they're, we're so far removed from it. Uh, you know, maybe yeah. maybe not in Europe where you live, but it's certainly in it's the two United degrees. States. I think it's only about two degrees of separation in the U.S., but it is right close uh, home here in in Europe, and and yep. uh, I'm in Germany. I'm, I mean, just in the last uh, three months, I, I went to the barber about three months ago, and and beforehand, it was like nine o'clock in the morning. I went into a bakery. And I walked in and I was like, oh, you're already all sold out for today. And the lady said, no, it's it's like this. We're thinking about a, a new model for business or, or going out of business because we can't get any deliveries. All our all our uh, wheat, flour and oils come from the Ukraine to make bread and they didn't have any bread. And then just last week I went into a totally separate bakery and uh, same thing that there's there was nothing there. They just we're apologizing in advance. It says it has to do with Ukraine. And, and uh, you you mentioned it as well. It's not just the bread. Now, uh, Oktoberfest here in Germany is coming up and they're having a beer shortage. There's no carbonation for the beer. There's no wheat and grains to barley and hops to, to, to do that because a lot of it comes from the Ukraine, believe it or not. 
And so not only is it going to be a tough winter because of gas and, and uh, the, the fossil fuels that, that uh, Germany and Europe uses from, from Russia, but it's going to be tough because now bread and the basics of, for Germans' beer uh, is being effective. So hopefully they'll realize that food as a commodity is cheapens life and it really puts humanity in a bad bad place, in a bad position. And it, it's ex it's exploitive of the Ukraine as well. So we, yeah. we can take their commodities and charge them just very cheap, cheapen food and not pay them the true cost or the fair value, which we were talking about the true cost report of the TEB um, um, re reports and, and documents. But then when times are tough and war or conflict comes around, then we don't realize that we've kind of pushed them into that situation. Yeah. We've created that situation. And all we can do is complain because the essential services, the energy or the, the food is no longer there. And yeah. I think that short-term vision or that forgetting of what happened to the food workers, what happened when there was no uh, nothing being delivered in those lockdowns, that that is, uh, that is not how our world works. And that short-termism, that short-sightedness, I think really needs to be changed. That's a, something I don't know how much you're hearing in discussions or, or you're working on. But I really would love to see globally uh, our food systems uh, get out of the commodities area where we're yeah. no longer trading it like an investment because it's it's our basic human need and it can't be traded like a commodity. Absolutely. I think you also brought up two other really good points. One is is that we need more regionalized and localized food systems, right? So that Germany is not so dependent on Ukraine, that the United States is not so dependent on Ukraine, and that Ukraine, you know, could feed itself. I mean, it's going to have a hard time next year. That that country is going to, you know, it's having a hard time now. Farmers are literally on the front lines of, of a war, right? And and trying to, to farm and, you know, fight for their country, right? So, you know, we we need those those regionalized food systems so that we're not so dependent on other parts of the world and at the same time you see food use being being used as a weapon food and fuel being used as a weapon putin has has become an expert at that right and and you know with the the blockade and you know and thankfully that's you know now more uh, wheat is getting out of Ukraine and, and hopefully other things too. But like that, that, that kind of warfare is, is disgusting. And it is because food is a commodity that we don't have a universal right to food. And if those things were in place, then, you know, we wouldn't see what we're, we're seeing now. So it, it is, it's, it's a tragedy on so many different levels, but there are solutions, right? And, and you, you know, you talked about some of them and, and I really do think there, there is now this movement. And again, this is something I hoped that the pandemic had pointed out very clearly that, you know, with with disruptions in the supply chain and honestly truck drivers quitting all over the world because they just, it's, it's you know, it's a, sh sorry, it's a, like a, not a great job and it was especially wasn't Pity a great job, job yep. <laughs> during the pandemic. And so you, if, if we had more regionalized and localized food systems, if we weren't so dependent on the other parts of our own countries or other parts of the world for, for food, then, you know, yeah, it, it, we'd be in a different situation. There, during the pandemic, you, you saw a lot of people calling for bringing back local canneries, you know, local tinneries, you know, local uh, mills and for, for making bread and those kinds of things. The, right now, the United States doesn't have that kind of infrastructure. You know, Europe, I think, in some ways is, is better equipped to do that kind of thing because it didn't completely lose, you know, that, that sort of, um, can, you know, sort of more local connection to food. But we really need to invest in the infrastructure that would make it possible for us to, to regionalize our food systems. But right now, you know, and we earlier we talked about the farm bill. I don't think that'll be in the, you know, the 2023 farm bill in, in, in any, any, you know, sort of concrete way. And that's, that's, we're missing opportunities, like, and keep missing them. It's like opportunity after, after opportunity is lost here. It's not just an opportunity. It's also, uh, we're building, it would be a, a form of resilience, a prevention to build resilience into the system. So we, we, we know, even if we're not talking food, our world is uh, the most volatile 
uh, point in time in history it's ever been, climate change, uh, climate refugees, displacement, disruption, Brexit, uh, um, Ukraine, all, all sorts of craziness going on in, in the world. Um, we, we know about that, economic issues. And so why can't we build some infrastructure, some resilience into the system that we know those things are coming so that when the hard time comes, we'll be able to weather those storms or those rough times a little bit better um, during that time. I think that it, yeah. that would be so vital. Um, I, I, I love that you bring that up. I mean, th there's one other aspect in that. Not only is um, uh, some of our supply chains and, and, you know, driving food in refrigerated trucking around the world a big thing, but what we saw here in Europe with Brexit five times the land mass of the United Kingdom is used around the world to produce food for the United Kingdom. With the Brexit, the COVID, the lockdown, we've really seen huge areas of, of food disruption and security and issues for the United Kingdom um, occur. But all those those truck drivers who are driving food <clears throat> um, from France and through the channel uh, into the United Kingdom, they they couldn't go one because of Brexit and two because of the lockdown, and so there was some major major issues. And but those people need a job, so now they found jobs somewhere else with a little bit of security, and they don't want to go back to those jobs anymore. And now we've had uh, uh, God uh, rest her soul, the Queen passed away, and we now have King Charles. Um, but th there's there's some things that we're maybe not seeing or understanding that could come. There's I think it's more than 28 different colonies or areas around the world that are part of the United Kingdom, which are delivering food and things. This is an opportunity um, for for those areas to say, we don't want to be a colony anymore. We yeah. want to change it. Who knows what? Yeah kind of disruption or thing could happen there. I'm not trying to do any predictions or forecasting, but we just don't have a very stable system with some of the politics and the decisions we made long term. And so um, I, I uh, uh, coming from farming, coming from uh, those areas, I just don't see how can we plan on those future harvests? How can we plan on how we're going to build our crops and, and do our harvest and, and, prepare and, and be in that mindset, what does that future look like? Where are we going? And that really leads me to the hardest question I have for you today. And it, it, yeah, it, it's, it, it's probably the hardest. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure you'll do just fine. It's uh, the burning question. Um, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you, Danny? What does a world that works yeah. for everyone look like for you? I mean, such a good question. And you're right. It is a difficult question to answer. Like, you know, it's, 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 it's a world that's, you know, that focuses and, and puts importance on equity and equality and, and, and justice, especially food justice. It's a world that doesn't, as you said before, look at food as the commodity, that it looks at food as a, as a universal human right. It's, it's, a, it's a world that focuses on human rights because we don't now. It's a world where, where women and youth are valued um, and not dismissed. It's, it's a world where you know um, lived experiences are just as, as, as important and honored as PhDs. Um, it's a it's a world where things are 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 uh, more fair and 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 uh, you know we are not even close to getting there you know we we have seen so much disruption not just because of the pandemic but because of you know so many things the food and financial crisis that happened several years ago the you know the the racial disparity and and um, uprisings that have happened in, in the United States and in other places in the world and were much needed and continue to be much needed. We've, you know, there, there's, there's so many problems 
that we face. And But, you know, it goes back to what we talked about before. If we look at the food system, the food system can solve so many of the things that we're seeing, right? You know, whether it's the climate crisis or whether it's protecting biodiversity or whether it's improving that equity and equality that I talked about. The food, food, food and agriculture could be the central sort of point for all that. So, you know, as the world I want to see, right? Maybe it's not as far away as as I sort of think of it right now. Maybe it's the 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 world my stepchildren will have, right? Who are thirteen and nine, or maybe you know, maybe their kids will see it. But I, I do think there is this movement where people are fed up, right? They don't want this world that we now live in. They want something different and something better, and they are no longer, you know, you talked about the the twenty eight colonies that are under British, still under, you know. British rule. And as much as I admire, um, uh, I was going to call him Prince Charles, King Charles's focus on food and agriculture and his, you know, throughout his lifetime. And I've got his book here, Harmony. Right. Yeah. I've, you know, I've met him, right. And he's very yeah. sincere about his, 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 his viewpoints on food and agriculture, but you know, those, there will be disruptions. Those colonies need to be, you know, they, they, need to be independent. And I, you know, I'm not, I shouldn't say need to be, but I, if I were the, one of the people who lived in one of those places, I would certainly still, you know, want to, to have that sort of um, rule lifted. Anyway, I, I do think that, you know, we, the, the change is coming, right? And we can either, you know, be part of it, right? And, and, and help it along in a way that is, is nonviolent and, 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 um, peaceful or, you know, it, it, it won't be right. And I, I think again, we're, we have an opportunity for, for change here. Um, but it's only if we all sort of get on board and, you know, I, I, I think that I, maybe it's, you know, we talked about like how the pandemic didn't bring us together, how, um, the war in Ukraine is not bringing us together. Maybe it will be the climate crisis that brings us together because we, again, we're forced to. It's like those companies I talked about before. They're going to be forced to change because of the climate crisis. Maybe the climate crisis will force us all to change because it will be so prevalent. It will be so much. It already is a part of our daily lives. We, are, we don't always see it, but it will be so significant that we will be forced to come together and, and, and make actual change. I, I truly hope so, and and it's, uh, you know, I'm on the same way. Uh, it, it, uh, King Charles's book Harmony and his thoughts there, and 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 that I what we're coming back to, whether we've discussed it uh, blatantly in this conversation or not, is really these local economies, local food security that we're really not relying on food as a commodity from elsewhere. If there are colonies of the United Nations, if there are food producers for the US or for Germany that are elsewhere around the world, um, I, I think that that globalization or that trade of food should only come after the local economies are taken care of, the local um, areas who are those food producers are really doing a good job and and taking care of their own area i mean if um i i i think that in the situation with ukraine i i'm i'm not quite sure that they were always meeting their needs first before they were thinking right. about all the food that they would deliver to um, germany or elsewhere around the world and i think that's a real core not only for jobs, not only for true costs, but also to, uh, a, a tendency to fix that problem. My vision is very similar to yours as well um, on that. The, I have a few more questions before we wrap it up. And, and really, so next week, you'll be heading off to uh, New York Climate Week, maybe even this weekend as, as early to get there in advance. You're closer than I am. Um, and then we have COP27 in Shalman Sheikh, Egypt, and you're involved in things there. And so I'm basically asking you, what's coming down the road? What's Food Tank? Yeah. What are you working on? What What are some things that we should be watching for, hearing about? And uh, is there any more hopeful things that you're kind of really excited about that are coming up? Um, so 
I'm doing much less during climate week than you are. And you're right. I, I have a train ride. You have a, probably a couple of plane rides uh, to get there. Um, but uh, the, the, the thing I'm focused on in climate week, I'm working with um, uh, Mark Kaplan of Invisible and Whole Chain. He's a blockchain expert. And he's one of these people who um, I, I, I think he's one of the smartest people I've ever met. And he's very thoughtful about these things. And he's, he's one of those people who like, you know, he worked for Unilever for a long time, but now is really focused on, on, you know, changing the food system in creative ways, uh, through, through blockchain and through, um, different kinds of technology that create transparency and traceability in our food systems. He's working with the UN, uh, global compact, uh, uh, accelerator to um, put on a dinner that I will be um, emceeing next week with a lot of different um, business leaders and others who it'll be a working dinner to really come up with with you know concrete uh, ways of, of making solutions and, and there will be some really exciting um, announcements made that I can't share with you from really big uh, food companies. So it's it's a, kind of an exciting um, thing to be involved in. And, and I, I, I love working with Mark and because of his focus on really making sure that, that food systems are not just transparent and traceable, but they have more justice. He's been really involved in, in seafood traceability and you know why that's so important is because the seafood supply chain is is very corrupt it's 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 full of you know um uh you know companies lying about kind of where their seafood comes from and, and what actually what the seafood is you know they they claim you know one fish is a different kind of fish all of that kind of thing what mark's doing is, is eliminating that and it's helping eliminate you know slavery in, in, in the seafood industry, it's helping fishers get the, you know, the actual true um, cost of, of what they're, they're producing and what they're catching. So it's really, really, um, I think a game changing thing what he's doing. So it's, it's very exciting to just, you know, watch him kind of do his thing and, and, and be able to, to observe it because I, I do think he's one of those people who's gonna change the world. And then, you know, with COP27 coming up, Food Tank is involved. Um, we have our, our little hands in almost every pavilion that has, is doing anything on food. And this is, as you know, Mark, this is the first time that there's not just one food system pavilion, but three, right, um, at, 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 at COP. This is game changing. Last year at, at COP26, there were lots of discussions around food, but they were just sort of, you know, they were all, you know, happening in the blue zone. That's great. But they, there were not whole pavilions focused exclusively on food. You know, WWF at the Panda Pavilion had its own um, uh, discussions about food, but, you know, they're focused on on other things. And, you know, there was a lot of, of um, public zone events that were focused on food, but like having these three and probably four, there, it, it looks like there might be four food system pavilions is really exciting. Um, so, you know, there's- And the they're, the, they're the huger than the other pavilions. That's such a big thing. I'm so it's excited. So crazy. Yeah, yeah it's so awesome. So Klein Eat, um, we're working with them through with, with and with Olive Farms to have a day, two days devoted to to um, uh, you know uh, creating um, more resiliency in our food systems and also sort of um, creating better value chains. And then for food for climate, um, we're focused on food loss and food waste and. Um, uh, uh, gender and, and gender empowerment. So that's really exciting. Um, it looks like I'll be moderating some sessions at the WWF pavilion, and it looks like we'll be involved in the the um, the uh, food and a uh, agriculture organization, the United States pavilion. So we're just really excited about what's coming up. And I hope, you know, I'll, I know I'll be interacting with you and, and some other people I admire. So it's, it's just really this great opportunity. What I hope is that the delegates, the people who are making the decisions, uh, the decision, you know, the policymakers who will be there really listen, that they see the, the power that food has, that they see that, you know, this is not just about energy, and, you know, which we need more focus on and we need, you know, more renewable ways of, of supplying uh, energy, but we also need to transition our food systems in concrete ways. So it's a, it's a really exciting time and folks can go to foodtank.com to find out um, more about what we're doing. I love that. We, I mean, we, we, we didn't really touch too much on innovation, but we, over the years, have been involved in some pretty progressive, innovative 
companies, what you're talking about as as well as Mark and and involving blockchain and those things and and the seafood industry. There's some pretty groundbreaking forward forward moving thinking things. The problem is is um, this this is a new fifty years hence. Um, Winston Churchill was talking about the future of foods and alternate proteins and different ways of growing food. And actually the first discussion was 113 years ago where they were talking about those type of things. The problem is, is we didn't pave policy and the roadmap for scale and to roll out once those innovations were developed. And we, you and I are involved in a couple of companies that um, have come up with these great innovations and, and the product and, and the sustainability is fabulous. But now they've become policymakers and lawmakers and labeling right. and all and, and 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 for approvals, they've now got to change that industry because that industry or that uh, governance was still stuck in the dark ages, basically on yeah. how to produce food, how should it be there, and it's kind of more reactionary. Let's wait until the innovation comes up, and then we'll think about the policy or paving the roadmap. And, and I think that's that's uh, something that we did talk in, in our in our discussion today. Let's not wait till the problem comes. Let's create policy bills and actions in advance. We know the future is probably going to be a little volatile, and um, let's get those policies and things in place now instead of requiring those innovators or those new food producers to also pave that roadmap as well as conquer the other challenges that we have. Um, the last two questions I have for you is really, uh, if there was one message that you could depart to our listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? Even if it's two messages, that's fine. The power to change their life, right? Um, your questions are so easy, Mark. This is... Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, I, as you know, throughout my career, I've had this focus on, on, um, the, the need for investing in, in women, especially women farmers. So I think my, um, my message would be to honor and respect the role of women in our food systems, because if we do that, if women get the same financial resources, the same land access, the same educational opportunities as men, they could lift, you know, millions of people out of hunger. And, and I think we are still, you know, not valuing women in our food systems as much as we should. So I, I would ask your listeners to, to really think about that, the, the importance of gender equity. We've talked about a whole different, you know, all the realms of equity, but it's for me, you know, having the opportunity to talk to hundreds of women farmers, you know, in the United States and in Latin America and, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, I've learned so much from them and I hope that others can value them as much as I do. I think that would be a game changer if we invested in women in the same way we invest in, in sort of their male counterparts. I love that. I think it was back in 2018 um, at the Barilla Center for Food and Nutrition. Um, I, I've been and I've been saying it a lot, which is uh, uh, I get some looks and questions, you know, so the top top four ways to to um, draw down our global warming or all have to do with food the first is global food systems re reformation but the two that are most important is empowering girls and empowering women and, and that's a very diverse and broad area but most people don't realize how impactful that could be it's, and it's in that project drawdown that we talked about paul hawken you know it has the power to reduce not just greenhouse gas emissions to feed families and lives and, and enrich humanity better up to 75 percent impact in our in our world today now if if we realize that and so that's also uh, it will be my message and I, i'll make sure that that gets spread around there i i really appreciate you bringing that up because it's so vital the last question is, what have you experienced or learned in your journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Oh, God. 
You know, I, I, I feel like I've spent most of my life like just being a student, right? Like, you know, and, and, and um, I, before food tanks started, I wish I had, now I have them because I had to, right? I wish I'd had more business skills and like development skills. You know, um, when food tank first started, first started I was really bad at fundraising now I'm really I mean for the most part I'm really a lot better at it so I I think having those skills in place that like I think what we need the next generation of food system advocates to have is business skills and not just like the the education that we have we need practical skills too we need to know how to to talk to different kinds of people um who don't speak our language and often that's people like accountants or um funders and 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 and, and others who don't always um have the same sort of um vision that we have so uh, yeah I, I wish somebody had told me like hey take an accounting class <laughs> yeah and I, I i i can so appreciate that i i uh uh, and you you kind of give the answer a lot when we, and we both give the answer a lot we always talk food systems or we talk systemic or systems well the business aspect the accounting the economics of that that's a yeah you you're you've got the media or you've got the innovation but you've also got to cover all the you know the supply chain the resources that whole thing and so that's really that business part that a lot of people are like, I just want to be a farmer, but I don't want to do about the bookkeeping, the harvest. And well, that that's not a system. That's not something right. that's going to be very successful. So I, I, uh, I, the best advice you're giving us the greatest advice, Danny, <laughs> thank you so much for letting us all inside of your ideas. It's been a sheer pleasure. That's all I have for you today. Unless there's something else you didn't get a say and you want to say before I say goodbye. Mark, I've, you, I've talked so much. <laughs> it's been so great to see you and talk to you. Thank you for everything. You've done a lot for me throughout my uh, career, and I really appreciate you and, and, and what you give to the world. And, and um, so you, you are, you are well-respected, my friend, and I, I appreciate so much about you. You're an angel because I feel the total opposite. I think you've done more for me than I have done for you. I've don't don't see it the same but thank you so much i have to thank you as well you've been a sheer blessing in my life just knowing you and reading your work and, and following food tank it's been a sheer pleasure thank you so much danny have a wonderful day bye-bye you too take care mark bye